What's up, everyone? Welcome back for Collider Dailies and a happy Monday morning to you all, like Mike Joyce in the live chat. Hope you are doing well on this very rainy Monday morning in LA. Steve, how are you holding up over there? I, I, like, I'm assuming you're stuck in all day, so I guess this bad weather makes the cats very happy. Uh, it, I feed feral cats and they are not pleased with what's going on, uh, outside and, uh, you know, I'm doing my best to take care of them, but they are freaked out. But they have little houses, right? Uh, they have some stuff, but it, it's, uh, listen, when it's raining like this and it's really flooded, it, uh, you know, the animals are used to sunny and dry conditions. So, you know, there's like a back thing where like the animals come through and it's completely flooded. So, um, you know. It is what it is. Fingers crossed. Rain stops. It dries up quickly, specifically for your cats outside. Sure. <laughs> and, and no other reason. I'll suffer through the rain as long as they are okay, truly. We have a big lineup today, beginning with the box office report for the weekend. And we'll run through, uh, we'll run through a whole bunch of titles here. But if you saw the title of this video and you saw the thumbnail, you know the big story is how Argyle did at the box office. I'm pulling some of these stats from the Variety Report, but there's a whole bunch of box office reports out there, but I always like to let you know where I'm getting my information. So Argyle is number one at the box office, but it only made $18 million for its opening weekend from a total of 3,605 theaters. This one, of course, is backed by Apple and distributed by Universal, and the reported production cost on the movie reported is $200 million. Variety also goes on to note that some things working against Argyle right now are negative reviews and also a lower audience score. The movie currently has a 35% on Rotten Tomatoes and a C plus on Cinema Score. As for its worldwide total, it took in $17.3 million from 78 international markets. So that brings the word worldwide tally to $35.3 million. That is um, an alarming number to me, Steve. What do you think about how Argyle kicked off things at the box office? Uh, well, there's no getting around the fact that uh, Apple has to be disappointed. Uh, it is it is definitely not the number they were hoping for. It's not the number I think anyone was hoping for because we all want movies to do well at the box office. But I, I think you can attribute the $35 million worldwide to the, the reviews and the cinema score. You know, when you are not, when you, I think the cinema score is a C plus, which means audiences did not respond to it and uh, the reviews have not been good. And it just shows in this day and age, the importance of good reviews um, and a good cinema score. Uh, I had fun with Argyle. I had a lot of fun with Argyle actually, um, but I can't say to you, oh my God, you need to go see Argyle. You know, it's not on that level where, you know, like, um, I almost said something I'm embargoed on, um, <laughs> like something coming up and, uh, uh, but you know what I mean? Like when you see something that you're like, oh my God, I need to tell everyone about this, you know, that's going to do better at the box office. But ultimately long-term, uh, this movie is going to be streaming on Apple and something that I think you, you and I have talked about and what people maybe who are watching might not understand is when there is a move, when a movie goes theatrical and they do a full campaign the way Argyle did. Uh, at some point when it's on streaming, way more people are going to want to watch the movie because they've heard of it and they're like, well, what is this movie about? You know, and I, we know on Collider when a movie is in theaters and then it goes streaming, there's much more interest in that title. Once it goes on streaming, people are reading more of the, 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 the stuff we're writing. Um, so long-term Apple has, you know, this big movie that people are going to watch on the streamer. Uh, and so I think long-term they're going to be happy they have it uh but you know in the short term when you compare it to killers of the flower moon or napoleon and the numbers those films made it is a disappointment um so given your take on it do you think that argyle still has a chance to go on to become a trilogy as was originally planned at this moment no okay. I, I think that like I, I don't i don't know the movie has to do well in theaters or for it to continue when it gets on Apple, if a ton of people are watching it, it becomes their number one movie and Apple, you know, and people are signing up for Apple to watch it, uh, then maybe that can happen. But it also could be that um, down the road, Matthew Vaughn 
uh, bring some of Argyle into Kingsman somehow. And, you know, he does, you know what I mean? Like, you don't exactly know what's going to happen, but you, you can't make 35 million worldwide opening weekend and then think you can make a trilogy. Yeah, yeah. I have a I have a feeling Argyle's road probably ends about here. I was reading another piece that a Variety posted today about, you know, I think they're calling it, uh, you know, a lingering debate about Apple's releases. And in particular, they bring up Killers of the Flower Moon, which made $156 million globally, and then Napoleon, which made $219 million globally. So those movies fell just short of or slightly eclipsed their $200 million price tags. And Variety goes on to say that's a problem given the studio split tickets with the uh, ticket sales with the theaters. And on top of that, Apple also has to shoulder tens of millions in promotional costs, as well as distribution fees to Sony, Universal, and the other companies who are booking their movies in theaters. But then they do go on to note that Apple has a different business model. So the question then becomes, were those results, I love how they phrase this too, were those results good for streaming back ten poles or terrible for mega budgeted films with renowned directors and notable stars? I I, can, I feel I, I, go go for I, it, Steve. I was going to say I think Apple, when it's all said and done, they want to be able to have on the Apple homepage a picture of Martin Scorsese and Leonardo DiCaprio. They want to be able to show you know Joaquin Phoenix and Ridley Scott. They want to show. Henry Cavill and the cast, they want to be able to have these stars on the Apple homepage and being able to a advertise Apple. So it's also like it's you're spending money on branding and also they're trying to build a streaming platform. But ultimately, that that's really not like the streaming platform, I think, is almost secondary to their prime business, which is selling iPads and computers and iPhones and services and the Apple Vision Pro, like that's where they make their money. And this is all, you know, ancillary. So it's sort of like Prime Video being, you know, like they're designed to try to sell you paper towels and cat food or whatever you're buying. And the Prime Video is like the add-on. Um, obviously, they want it to be profitable and they want to make billions of dollars and all that. But they're just different business models than what like uh, Warner Brothers is doing, which is they need to make money in theaters. Yeah, there's no denying that it's a different business model. But, you know, I have to imagine at some point the branding doesn't serve them especially well when they become known for releasing a, uh, a steady stream of big budgeted box office failures. So I have to imagine that over the course of time, they're going to reassess their theatrical distribution model and figure out what works best for them. They just have the benefit of having extremely deep pockets and more time than others to figure that out. So hopefully hopefully they do and you know looking at killers of the flower moon in particular i mean having a, an, a heavily nominated oscar movie on their hands has to serve them and their branding quite well so it'll be curious to see how they evolve their models after this yeah and by the way like just to point out killers of the flower moon is up for a ton of awards and it's something that a lot of people are talking about and eventually that movie will be on apple tv so that's going to be something where if you have Apple TV and you've never seen the movie, you might want to watch it. And, you know, look, they're, they're not buying a studio at this point. So everything they're making is building their infrastructure. But like I've said a million times, Apple TV makes fantastic programming. Their TV shows are really fantastic. I watch a lot of them. And if I had to pick like one streamer that I like had to keep, Apple TV might be the streamer I keep because of their sci-fi shows and because of the quality of everything else. Like they're really good shows, you know? Um, anyway, I'm a big fan of what they're doing. I will confirm. I'm quite happy with the Apple TV shows that I have watched in recent months and years. All right. Just so you have a little more box office information on your hand. Number two at the box office was the chosen season four episodes one through three. If you are like me and you're like, what is that? I'll give you some information. Now it's a faith based TV series that apparently brought in six million dollars. Um, over the traditional weekend and $7.4 million since opening on Thursday. Fathom Events is rolling out the show's season four exclusively in cinemas with two-week runs from episodes one through three starting February 1st, followed by episodes four through eight later in the month. So this is a title that's probably going to come back on this list fairly soon. Yeah. Number three was The Beekeeper, which made another 
5.28 million. Right now, its worldwide total is uh, 122 million. So that one far exceeded what I thought it was going to make. Number four, Wonka. Look at the legs that Wonka has. My God, adding 4.7 million from 2,900 locations. After two months of release, Wonka has grossed $201 million domestically and more than 571 million globally. That is a it's a nice winner right there. And then at number five, we have another movie with legs. Migration, that one took in another 4.2 million. That means it's got 106.2 million uh, domestically, $210 million worldwide. And it has a $70, $70 million price tag. So looks like those those long legs helped turn its box office run into, uh, into a profit for the studio. And then just because I love it, Mean Girls is at number six. I'm just so glad, Steve, that Mean Girls is doing well after we were planning for it to get a Paramount Plus only release. Then they release it in theaters and it makes $92.7 million globally thus far. Yay. Thought, I'm happy for them. Yeah. I, I think the biggest surprise though is Beekeeper. Uh, I just want to say that I, I thought that movie was just a blast. It delivers on its premise. Uh, it, it's way better than it has any right to be. And that's because of David Ayer. Uh, and I'm really happy that it did so well because it means that David and Jason might make another, although they're making a different franchise uh, in the in the coming months. I forget the name of it, but it's based on a book series. of like 10 books. But I mean, uh, you know, Jason Statham and David Ayer, I hope they make more movies together. Yeah, I feel like uh, given how well it's doing, I'm prioritizing circling back and actually catching that one sooner rather than later, whereas Argyle is not on the top of my must-watch list. All right, second topic of the day is Cobra Kai. So this will be a short and sweet conversation, but it is a nice video that probably makes a lot of fans, including myself out there, quite happy. Netflix just released a, a really nice little montage movie, basically announcing the start of uh, production on season six. It's the main actor's teasing that they're working on something, that they can't reveal spoilers. And, you know, part part of me, admittedly, is always going to be disappointed when I get a new video like that. And there's like no new information there. But given, I mean, it's not like it's been that long since season five, but it feels like a really long time when you love a show this much. So it's nice to see something. It's nice to see something to, you know, give me that extra little jolt of energy and enthusiasm. Not like my enthusiasm is gone anywhere, but it's just nice to see everyone and get hyped for what's to come. Steve, how'd you feel about this video? I didn't watch the video and uh, there's no reason because it's all, you know, BS. It's just them being all happy. Uh, I saw, I want to make sure I pronounce his name. Sholo. Is it Zolo? I saw Zolo last night Sholo. at Saturn Awards. Wait, what? Sholo. Sho Jesus Christ. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm not even going to say it now because I'm, I'm mortified. Uh, but I saw him last night at the Saturn Awards. Uh, he was either flying out last night or this morning to go back to Atlanta I hope he got out with this rain that's going on. Um, but he uh, said that he told me how many scripts he's read, but I don't know if that's public knowledge, so I won't say it. Mm -hmm. But he seemed really happy. He was filming. He needs to be on set today. And he said that he's going to be filming, I think, till May or June, um, which means that because it's not a CGI show, it actually means we could get season six end of this year. Uh, but it could be that they're going to wait till next year. Um, I, I don't know. Did they announce it would be this year? That was the impression I was under. But now that we're talking about it, I'm afraid that it wasn't 100%. And I don't want to give anyone the impression that it was officially locked for 2024. But I think my mind had kind of... Um, had kind of cemented in the idea that a holiday release for 2024 was uh, was a good uh, m a good release strategy for the show. It's worked for them in the past, so that's kind of just what I was assuming. Well, I mean, if they wrap, even if they wrap in June, again, there's no CGI on this show. This is like very, you know, practical. So I, I would think, and because. I would think they could release it, it for the holidays, but it is you know. it is confirmed. By the way, I'm I'm reading a I'm reading like after a quick Google just to be sure before I say this out loud. It's uh it's a you know the the highlighted piece on Google is from the Economic Times, and it says Netflix confirmed the final season's release in 2024. Yeah, it'll be the end of the year. I would imagine November December. Um, but you know, it, listen, I'm I'll watch it the day I get it. So, yeah, me too. You know, holidays. 
holidays. It's it did so it did so well when it released during the holiday period, Christmas and New Year's, when people didn't really have a whole lot to go out and do. I mean, granted, I think that was more during lockdown times when people weren't prioritizing seeing things on the big screen. So that could change the mentality around it. But I, for one, really loved celebrating the holidays with a new season of Cobra Kai. Yeah, the real issue is that I, I know they're making a new movie, mm -hmm. and uh, I don't know when it comes out. Is it supposed to be coming out this Christmas? Because I'm not ready for all these on-the-spot questions. Yeah, but like, because I don't know if you want to release a Cobra Kai movie and then season six at the same time. Um, uh, oh, yeah, look, Steve, uh, on one of the comments, uh, when Ralph Melch starts filming the new Cobra Kai movie, the movie scheduled for December this year. Fact is, he might have already filmed his stuff. I mean, he might be a cameo. We don't know how much of a party he is, but he, you know, obviously Ralph is involved in um, season six. So basically, we don't know. Mm -hmm. Like I'm saying, I don't know what's going to happen. But let's move on to the next thing. But Cobra, sure. a lot of Cobra Kai is coming. A lot of Cobra Kai, a lot of Karate Kid. I will never argue with that. All right. So our final topic of the day is... It's just something fun. I just wanted to talk about what we watched over the weekend because I know I have something I'm very excited to to blab about. Steve, what about you? Did you watch anything over the weekend that folks should check out themselves? Uh, yeah, I am moderating some panels at the uh, SCAD TV Fest in Atlanta starting Wednesday. I'm flying there tomorrow, assuming the rain lets me leave. Um, and I'm moderating the My Adventures with Superman panel. So I binged that over the weekend. and. A lot of people have told me how good it was, and they were all right. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a fantastic Superman show. Um, and the reason it's fantastic is they're doing stuff that hasn't really been done in the movies or TV with Superman, which is Superman, Lois, and Jimmy are all interns at the Daily Planet. Uh, Superman, Clark Kent, Superman, uh, does not know his origin. He's figuring it out. So... Um, he doesn't, you know, uh, he doesn't know about Krypton. He doesn't know his heritage. He doesn't know about his powers. No one's told him. So he's figuring things out. Jonathan Kent is still alive. Um, there's just a lot of things that are, yeah, as, as Mike Kay said, I, I agree. Uh, it's really, really well done. Like, I was really surprised. And the animation's cool. Mm -hmm. and a great mix of comedy and action and romance. Uh, thumbs up. I'm really happy to, to moderate. Uh, and then I did the Saturn Award. I watched some other stuff, but I also went to the Saturn Awards and uh, uh, that was a lot of fun seeing everyone, you know, that's like the award show I I love the most just because it's what I, you know, these are all my interests, sci-fi, fantasy, genre. Um, and it was great to see, you know, the cast of Star Trek, The Next Generation or Feige um, uh, or William Shatner introducing uh, Seth MacFarlane. It was a lot of funny stuff. I posted a lot of videos on my social. Good stuff. Good stuff. I find uh, I find it funny that we both have animated series to recommend. Animation is just crushing it right now. So I sat down to watch Has Been Hotel with some friends this weekend. And like, I, I just assumed we'd watch like an episode or two and then go do other things. I, I binged the entire season in a single evening. I'm I'm like a little obsessed with it, just in case anyone out there doesn't know what it is, which feels unlikely because it's so hugely popular. It's an adult animated musical comedy. It's centered on the character Charlie, Charlie Morningstar, she's the princess of hell, and she creates a hotel hoping that sinners could be rehabilitated there. So she basically has the hopes of them ultimately checking out and then being allowed into heaven. And she's doing that because they have this other annual process where like heaven and, and angels from heaven come down and, and purge souls in hell because hell is overpopulated. So she's trying to fix that problem. The series was produced by uh, A24, which you all know I, I love, 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 A24, um, with Bento Box Entertainment and also in collaboration with Amazon. They've already confirmed a second season. And I think the, the official stat is that it's the largest global debut for a new animated series on Prime Video. And it's so well-deserving of all that success. I thought it was absolutely phenomenal in every single respect. Instantly fell in love with all the characters. The animation is just so like uniquely vibrant and bold and just like a real treat and pleasure to look at. And let me tell you, Steve, those songs are 
A plus across the board. I have not stopped listening to the damn playlist. I have them all stuck in my head. I cannot wait for more. There's a good chance that Has Been Hotel might go on to become one of the best new TV series, period, I will watch in 2024. Real, I just really thought the quality of the show was above and beyond. Cannot recommend it enough. So it's funny. Everyone has told me how good it is. I might actually download it all to watch on the plane to Atlanta. And you will be upset when I tell you that we almost did a screening event for that series, but I had already booked Queen and IMAX that event when, uh, and then you were out of town. And uh, it was one of those where we just, you know, couldn't make it work. But um, season two, anyway. season two. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, but Amazon has all been really like, you need to watch, you need to watch. And every everyone I know has said, you need to watch. So I think I'll be watching it on the flight. It's, it's that good. It's that good. Seriously, like really, really exceptional animation, storytelling, and just like show making period. I loved it. Before we go, Steve, is there anything you would like to promote? Like the many, many screenings we have coming up? <laughs> uh Honestly, we have so many events coming up. Uh, we have a few FYC things that you and I will both be hosting for, I mean, I can't even remember how many events we have. But the, the big one is we are doing the season two, speaking uh, of cool events, we are doing the season two premiere of Extraordinary uh, on Thursday night in LA. We are showing it like a month before it comes out. We have the two leads and the creator of the series. You're moderating. Um, we still have some tickets left, so if you want to go to the premiere, um, essentially the premiere, it's going to be at Landmark Theater Sunset. If you go on... Um, I just dropped the link in the live oh, chat, yeah. so anyone wants to, you can copy and paste it and get over to that article pretty quickly. Yeah, and like in the bottom, there's an RSVP link, um, but we, I, I can tell you uh, we are working behind the scenes on like seven events. Like it's crazy how much I'm working on, like... Uh, I'm not sure when we're announcing what, but we have some really, really cool stuff coming up. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have these FYC screenings where you can see, you know, films that are being nominated for Best International Feature. And we have some others that haven't been announced yet that are pretty good that are uh, about to be announced this week, I think. Um, and if you want to see, you know, the creatives behind it, um, that's your opportunity. Yep. I'll just add for, oops, hi, Robin. Um for for this one, for the extraordinary uh, event, if you haven't seen season one, I'll tell you it's really good and it's a very quick binge and it's like it's just delightful. It's a very smart concept and you know I always like unique spins on the superhero genre, so I really appreciate the series. So you could binge it really quickly and then be ready to watch the season two premiere with us. So highly recommend that. And then the FYC one I'll promote is I'm moderating the Perfect Days one on Sunday at, uh, at with Landmark. So I highly recommend joining us for that as well. You could check out the Landmark website for tickets to that one. But it's going to be a lovely event especially if you just want like a palate cleanser before the Super Bowl. You can't do football all day on Sunday. You should see an Academy Award nominated movie and then go watch the Super Bowl. I feel like that's the perfect pairing, right, Steve? Sure. sure. I'll also say on Monday the 12th, we're doing Past Lives. I'm moderating that one. On the 13th, we're doing Teacher's Lounge. I'm moderating that one. I think we're about to be announcing the one on the 15th, mm -hmm. which is one that a lot of people watching this will probably want to see. Uh, and then there's another one that we're waiting to announce that I think a lot of people watching this would want to see. We Very have some really accurate. Cool Very accurate. All right. With that, that is a wrap on today's edition of Collider Dailies. Steve, safe travels to you. You will be stuck with uh, me, John, and Maggie for the rest of the week. And it will be a lovely week. So... Have a good one, everyone. If you're in LA, stay safe, stay dry, and we will see you tomorrow morning, 10 a.m. Pacific, for a new edition of Collider Dailies.